with your new uh, wonderful center. I'm very excited to see quantum information, you know, finally make it and uh, get its own center uh, at uh, Hebrew University. So that's really wonderful. So I'm going to give a, a kind of a little, I want to like to talk about quantum adiabatic algorithms. I put an S there because it has many different meanings. I am not going to give a comprehensive review. <coughs> I'm just going to highlight a few points. And I would be very happy to have a discussion about any of this. So if anything I say uh, you don't understand or it bothers you, please just stop me, okay? And we can chat about it, okay? So, uh, so this is going to be my talk. Now, how do you operate this? Uh, press a button. Okay, so this idea, the way I am, and I'm going to give very few references, but whenever I give references, I'm going to give one to myself. <coughs> so it's uh, also uh, self-centered in that way. So anyway, this, I, I wrote a paper in 2000 with Jeffrey Goldstone, Sam Gutman, and Michael Sipser called Quantum Computation by Adiabatic Evolution. Now, this was not the first introduction of this idea into the subject. Uh, the people had thought about it before us, but we kind of wrote a paper that I think put it in the context pretty well of computation. And um, it's a general approach to combinatorial search problems. It's a quantum approach. It doesn't mean, it's an approach. I didn't say it's successful. I just said it's an approach to combinatorial search problems. And um, it also has a feature, the quantum adiabatic uh, algorithm, that it is universal, which means that, and Dorit and others showed this, which means that any computation, quantum computation in the gate model, can be recast as quantum computation by adiabatic evolution. And I am not going to talk about that, but except a little bit. So I am going to, I want to talk more about this algorithm as something that is related to combinatorial search, not to uh, its universal properties. And another thing that's interesting about it is because it involves what, ground state quantum computation, uh, it might be a good design for building a quantum computer because it's a design, the algorithm works by keeping the state of the system in its lowest energy state. And therefore you might think that if you had a cold quantum computer always in its ground state, uh, that, that, arc, that design of, the, of machinery is very consistent with the algorithm. And that might be a good, therefore, approach to designing a quantum computer is to, be adiab to run the adiabatic algorithm. Okay? So let me tell you how this thing works. So again, I'm going to be interested in search problems. So I have n bit instances of a problem. And, and uh, the problems are always that I'm interested in have local clauses. And what the clauses are are constraints on subsets of the bits. And local means that the constraints involve only a few bits. And let's call E of Z, and so Z is a bit string. Z, Z1 through Zn are all zero and ones. And E of Z is a function, and it's the number of violated clauses. And our task in combinatorial search is to find the minimum of E. And you could be looking for the minimum of E if, if you're looking for an, uh, to solve a decision problem, you might ask whether that energy is below something, or you might ask whether it's zero, or you might just be interested in minimizing E. Um, and this is classically hard in general. Uh, this task is either NP-complete or NP-hard. And, you know, there's a question about whether a quantum computer could do better. Um, it's a natural question for us to ask, can quantum computers solve this kind of problem more efficiently than uh, classical computers. I think that's one of the reasons that some of us got interested in quantum computing for the hope that it would be useful for solving problems that ordinary computers find difficult. Of course, that's the first great example of that is the Shaw factoring algorithm where there's a wonderful speed up and we'd like to see can we find even little speed ups for other problems. So the natural idea here is to uh, in, instead of minimizing a function, <laughs> but rather to find the ground state of a Hamiltonian. So we're going to turn this function 
into a Hamiltonian. And the way we do that is, first of all, we go to a, a two to the n dimensional, if these are bits, then we go to a two to the n dimensional vector space, which consists, it's a product st space. It, you can think of it as a tensor product of um, coming from, uh, the, uh, uh, it, it's just a, the helper space of n spin a half particles. Let me just say that. It's just the spin, and, it, and, and, uh, you, and, and this um, energy function it can be thought of as diagonal in, in this basis, and I can define a quantum operator, HP, in this way, which is just a Hamiltonian, which is diagonal. And on the diagonal are these values of the energy. And the, ch and the, uh, the task now is to find the ground state of this Hamiltonian. So I haven't really done too much, but that's the idea. Now we're gonna I want to remind you what the adiabatic theorem says. The adiabatic theorem says the following thing. It says, suppose you have a, a, a different Hamiltonian, h twiddle of s, which is a parameterized Hamiltonian. S goes between 0 and 1. And this Hamiltonian, at any value of s, has a set of eigenstates. You can just think of these as finite dimensional Hilbert's, uh, a finite dimensional vector space. You have a discrete spectrum. And the, I can list the eigenvalues, but they, te te they depend on the parameter s. So they're either called the instantaneous eigenstates if I let i equal g, I call that the ground state. That's the lowest one. It's the lowest of them all. I don't, let, I don't write less than or equal. I'm assuming the ground state is lower than anything else. And then what you do is you define an actual Hamiltonian, which depends on time, not on the parameter, but it depends on time uh, in this fashion where you've introduced another time scale, capital T, which is a big time. And when capital T is big, this Hamiltonian is changing very slowly because this capital T, what it does is it stretches out the evolution from, a, uh, from an interval from 0 to 1 to an interval from 0 to capital T. So this makes it slowly changing. And what you then do is you evolve according to the Schrodinger equation. This is the law that governs all quantum systems. It's never been violated. You assume that at time 0, you're in you, by, uh, by assumption at time zero, you're in the ground state of the instantaneous Hamiltonian. And if you evolve the time capital T, you have the slowly evolving Hamiltonian, but you evolve the time capital T, then the adiabatic theorem says that in the limit, as T goes to infinity, the overlap between the state at cap time capital T and the, ground st and the instantaneous eigenstate at S equals 1 is 100%. And that's a math theorem, and it assumes that this ground state is isolated from the first excited state by some non-zero number, and then you take a limit. But of course, this is a, it sa and what this just says is that if you uh, slowly change a Hamiltonian, if you change it really, really slowly, you'll always track the instantaneous ground state if you go slowly enough. I call it schlepping it along. You schlepped this state along. I went too fast, or didn't I? I don't know what I did. OK, fine. So, uh, but the question then becomes not about a limit, but how slow do you have to go? Well, it turns out how slow you have to go depends on the actual energy gap between the ground state and the first excited state. And if I call that gap g, then the, the rate at which you, the time that you have to evolve for has to be of order 1 over the gap squared in order to have substantial overlap with the instantaneous ground state. So the adiabatic condition is that you must go slower in units of the gap, 1 over the gap squared. And this is a math theorem also, uh, which can be proved assuming that things are smooth. You can prove this under some smoothness assumptions. OK? Oh, yeah, great question. So you have to, on the top, I, I, there is a, a dimension full parameter because if, um, if h bar is 1, then time and energy have inverse units. And this is an energy and that's a time. So I have to put something upstairs. And the, but the stuff I put upstairs uh, is not really going to have much bearing on the discussion. But I know that there is a, there is a numerator. I'm just ignoring it. Okay. So now, so this is the, for the quantum adiabatic algorithm, the general approach is you want the ground state of the problem Hamiltonian. 
So what we're going to do is design a particular interpolating Hamiltonian. And the way we're going to design it is so that the, at, to, at zero, when the parameter is zero, we have what we call the beginning Hamiltonian, which is easy to construct, which has a ground state, which is easy to make. And at, at, when the parameter is one, we have another Hamiltonian, which is exactly the problem Hamiltonian, which is also easy to construct, but its ground state is hard to find. So the idea is we're going to start in a state which is the ground state of the system because we can find it and, and we know what that is. We're going to morph the Hamiltonian by some root into the problem Hamiltonian and if we go infinitely slowly we will find the ground state of the problem Hamiltonian even if the problem that we're trying to solve is NP hard or NP complete because I said I took an infinite amount of time. So the question um, as, you know, the obvious question is, how long do you really need? Now, the usual choice that we make for this is the following. First of all, for this interpolating Hamiltonian between the beginning Hamiltonian and the problem Hamiltonian, we put a simple par uh, parametric dependence where we turn off the beginning Hamiltonian and we turn on the problem Hamiltonian. S goes from 0 to 1. And a very simple choice for the beginning Hamiltonian is simply a magnetic field in the x direction. If you have a magnetic field in the x direction, then your initial state is your spins lined up in the x direction. So we just line up all your spins in the x direction. That's a trivial state to start with. Turn off that magnetic field. Turn on the problem Hamiltonian. Please, if there are any questions, ask me. OK? So how well does it do? That's the question. Does it, how well does it do? Again, I'm thinking of it on problems. I'm not thinking of it as a universal computer. Well, let's take a problem like KSAT. KSAT is a, pro a satisfiability problem with um, the restriction that each clause involves no more than k bits. So it's local in that sense. Sometimes we talk about generalized case. I don't really care too much if the clauses are in conjunctive normal form. That's not really important to me. So could maybe call it generalized case set. So now the energy function is a sum of over cl individual clauses and because this counts the number of violated clauses. But because it's a sum over individual clauses which involve only k bits, the whole Hamiltonian is now a k-local Hamiltonian. That means even with the beginning Hamiltonian, since this is k-local, this thing is k-local because of the form of the beginning Hamiltonian I gave you, it was one local. So now we have a k-local Hamiltonian. And what's somewhat interesting about this is it treats, this, is, this uh, approach, it treats KSAT and max KSAT in the same way because we're just looking to uh, minimize a function. And in satisfiability problems, you want to know whether that function value is 0 or not. And in max problems, you want to find the optimal solution. But it's approaching it the same way. So, it and so for example, it treats 2sat and max 2sat the same way. But 2sat is in p, and max 2sat is np complete. So um, it's treating a, 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 a problem which classically um, one version of it is NP and, one, and another version is NP. Oh, max 2 sat is NP hard, I should have said. Sorry. It's NP hard. Um, it's, not NP, it's NP hard. Sorry. Uh, but anyway, it's treating them uh, the same way. And, and so, you know, I would guess that the quantum adiabatic algorithm fails on. Uh, two sat or succeeds on two sat in the same way here probably doesn't see a difference between these two problems. Yeah. What's the difference between the max version and the non max version? Okay, the non max version is simply I give you a set of clauses only involving two bits and I ask you is there a satisfying assignment? Or not, is there an assignment that satisfies all the clauses? That's a decision question. It's a yes, no. Is there one that satisfies all the clauses? This is a simple algorithm for that. But if I tell you, but after you've decided that it's not satisfiable, if I say find the configuration 
that maximizes the number of uh, satisfied clauses, that's NP hard. So if you could solve that, you could solve the traveling salesman problem. Okay. So we have no general results about the quantum adiabatic algorithm in this regard. We cannot show that it solves two sat. Yeah. It, 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 um, you mean if well if you were to solve max two set it means that you would find that. No, oh, do you have a check on? Is, no, that's why I shouldn't have said NP complete. It's NP hard. It's NP hard. It, it's not in NP. I miss. I wrote something wrong. It, max two set is not in NP. It's it's not in NP. But if you had an algorithm for it, you could solve everything in NP. I just I just wrote something wrong. So when you say that k sat and max k sat are treated the same way, you mean by the, the same amount of time for the adiabatic? Yeah, the adiabatic algorithm approaches them the same way because what the adiabatic algorithm is doing is it's just minimizing the cost function. And so it doesn't really know when it's approaching it whether you're asking a different question, which is, is this cost function going to turn out to be zero? But do we know that the gap is the same? Maybe one of them has a smaller gap? Does, no, we don't know that. No, we don't know. One, maybe one of them has a small. Uh, no, 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 because it's. Um, uh, I, uh, it, uh, maybe no, you can no, they encode them differently. Hmm? I'm sorry? Maybe you can encode them differently uh, because it's a different question. Maybe you could. Yeah. yeah but if you just do the naive encoding. Then right, that's right. If you just do the naive okay. thing, which is I give you a bunch of clauses and now you try to minimize the cost function, then the way I'm treating these two problems is the same. You, well, I don't really know why we would know that, that the gap closes much. In the, we're talking about the minimum gap in the middle of the evolution. And I don't think we know whether it closes smaller or, or not, it closes faster or not. Whether, hmm? There's no, I don't There's think no we know. There's no reason to believe these behaviors. Yeah. Oh, that's a very good point, so yeah. There is, a, there is a qualitative difference between the two. That's a good point. He's saying, you see, that's a good point. I mean, if you, I, 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 that is a good point. That's a well-taken point. If, if we look at 2SAT, if I told you I had an algorithm, let's say for 2SAT or 3SAT, it suffices for me to look at cases which are satisfiable. Because if I tell you I have an algorithm and it finds a solution on a satisfiable instance, I don't really care what it does in the unsatisfiable case. So it would be <laughs> sufficient to restrict attention to only satisfiable instances in, let's say we were doing 2SAT or 3SAT, and those are not frustrated, and maybe that does affect the gap. That's a good point, which I should have made. Thank you. Oh, maybe if you have more, make you have to go a little bit slower, yeah. Well, I don't know if it grows exponentially. I mean, we're not, we never am talking about an exponential number of clauses here. I'm typically talking about a polynomial number of clauses. I'm sorry? Well, yes, but, but I'm, I, I'm, I really care about whether, I don't really care if it's polynomial. And I, I'm typically here, we're interested in a number of clauses which is of order n where n is the number of bits. That's typically what we care about. We don't really care usually about more, much more than that. OK, good. I'm glad people are asking questions. OK, next. So, so anyway, let's give a couple of examples. Um, let's say I look at 2SAT on a ring where I only have agree clauses. So this is a very simple problem uh, where I have a ring. And by the ring, this, this says this, this bit is connected to this bit, this bit is connected to this bit. And, and my clause, it's not exactly too sat because it's, it's, it's not conjunctive normal form. But uh, this, the clause here says these two bits should agree. This should agree. So you know what the satisfying assignment is. Everyone agrees. So it's very simple. But if we look at this Hamiltonian, which is the actual quantum Hamiltonian for this problem, where I actually put a... I, this is the actual Hamiltonian that I, I, I want to put on the board because I want to show you that we can actually do a calculation. And using this Hamiltonian, which is the same as the other one, 
I just put a little one here in the, for this, and this, this says the two bits should agree. The minimum gap is 4 pi over 3n, but it's a lot of work to calculate that. And there are very few cases where you can actually exactly solve for the gap. And this is one of the only cases, and that's because you can do something called a Wigner-Jordan transformation. And the Wigner-Jordan transformation is something that you can't do in general. So this is, there are very few cases where you can actually calculate the gap. Yeah. It wasn't Ben Reichardt, it was, uh, it was yeah, Daniel Fisher. Yeah, but Ben proved it. Uh, Daniel, Fisher, uh, Daniel Fisher gave the result way before Ben Reichardt. But, yeah. but, but it doesn't matter who did it, but well. what's, the, what's the actual, uh, is it the, the Oh, you want me to explain that example? No, 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 but uh, how does it differ from this Yeah. One? Well, I'll tell you what that example is. Well, Mish is bringing up an, an interesting case, which was introduced for the condensed matter community by uh, Daniel Fisher, who said, in, for these bonds here, let's, um, let's instead of having a, a this has a, vi the, the cost for not satisfying the bond here is one. But what you could do is randomly put numbers here which are uh, ones or twos. So sprinkle down ones or twos. Now, if you do that, then um, you, the, the classically, you still have the exact same satisfying um, assignment. Because whether the bonds are stronger or weaker, uh, you still have all, it, they still are agree bonds. But it turns out that if you randomly sprinkle these, and you can do it in another way, you can have um, runs of length squared of n, uh, then the gap actually goes, in that case, like 1 over a uh, constant to the square root of n. So um, that random case, which is very, very delicate, because if you blow on it, it goes away. But if you, if, it's a very delicate case. But it is true that that is another case. And the gap goes like, I'll just write it down, 1 over a constant to the square root of n for that case. Is that the one you, I think that's what you were referring to. Hmm? Yeah, the no, no, Reichardt had that. That's the result. The gap goes like a one over, I know the result. It goes like constant to the square root of n. I know the result. I'm quite sure of that. Okay? So anyway, there are very few exact answers. But of course, this is, this would be amazing. Like if we could ever show that the adiabatic algorithm on interesting problems went like, the, the runtime went, went like a constant to the root n, that would be really amazing. You know, uh, in fact, when, this, when Peter Shaw saw this, he said, great, you know, maybe that's what happens on typical random instances. And that would mean that you have a sub-exponential but super polynomial algorithm. And that would be quite interesting. Okay? So now, since it's very hard to find exact results, you can ask about numeric, how, how else can you approach this problem of gap estimation? It's really hard. So what you might, oh, sorry. So um, I am really spastic with this thing. Ah, sorry. I don't know why I can't deal with this. So anyway, you could do numerical evidence. So one way to approach this problem is to say, OK, I give you a, um, a let me just, use an, a regular computer and diagonalize the Hamiltonian and estimate the gap. And see, as I increase n, what do I get? And so, but if you do exact diagonalization, if you actually want to find the eigenvalues of a matrix, you can't really do that for a matrix whose size is more than about 2 to the 24. If you want to actually diagonalize it, you know. Another question is here, how do you choose the ensemble of problems? Oh, yeah, Maybe that's Maybe the true. interesting problems are actually hard generically or, or easy. Oh, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Let, I'm just talking about how you run the computer. Yeah, we'll, t we'll talk about an ensemble in another second. Okay, but here, I'm just saying, if you want to run a computer and do it, you, c you can't do it for n more than about 24. And that means that if you want to try to guess whether the gap is, how the gap is growing, if you can only go out to 24, you're kind of restricted. But so quanti and that's just because quantum computers are hard to simulate. 
I mean, this is part of the point of quantum computers that, you know, the problems which are simple for a quantum computer are hard to simulate. So this is facing that, okay? But let me go to the next page and maybe I'll be able to answer your question. So then you might say, let's try another method for gap estimation. And that other method is called quantum Monte Carlo. And I want to be clear about something which is a little confusing to me sometimes, that quantum Monte Carlo is a classical algorithm for quantum systems. But we're stuck with this. So that's just it. So you have to keep remembering quantum Monte Carlo is a classical algorithm. So it's a way of estimating gaps in quantum systems, which is standard in the condensed matter community. And um, it uses a different technique than exact diagonalization. It doesn't just, you know, do householder transformations or lanchos or something like that. It does the sampling technique, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And you might look at certain problems. Um, for example, you could, might say, let's toss some problems from an ensemble. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. And one problem which people like to look at, which we actually looked at, is a three regular 3x OSAT. And this is a problem where you have uh, all the clauses involve three bits, and the constraint is that z1 plus z2 plus z3 mod 2 is 1. And what that, um, that says that you, know, you, you want one or three of the bits to be ones. And it, we generated random instances of this problem and, th and looked at quantum Monte Carlo. And, um, you could, and, and three regular means that each bit is in three clauses. And you can clearly see an exponentially small gap. And this is confirmed by another technique called quantum cavity. So this is a problem where it really looks like the adiabatic algorithm is having trouble. This is also a problem. This is a, the reason we chose this problem is it's rather fascinating because this problem was really causes problems for almost all classical algorithms, have difficulties with this problem, except for one classical algorithm, which is called linear algebra. Because this problem, all the clauses are in this form. So you can solve this problem by Gaussian elimination. So this problem is in P, because it can be solved in P. But yeah? So wait, 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 wait. So it, it, sorry, just coming back, it, yeah. it was exponentially. What right had proved was C squared of n? No. OK, well, I'll get to that later. I can't so, believe so that. In fact, it wasn't a random. He just did a, a square root block. No, no, just a, just a cycle where every alternate two, term. Two, one, two, one, two, one. Two, two, one, two, two, one, two, one. OK, I'll look at that later. OK, I'll, I'll talk about that with you later. I'm very surprised, because I'm pretty sure that was the result. OK, we can talk about it. OK. Um, because he, uh, he, oh, he alternates them one, two, one, just one, two. OK. OK, we could talk about that. So let's get back to this then for a second. So this problem is in P. And yet, this problem is known to be difficult for, uh, I'm really, how am I doing on time? Terrible? Ah, tell me how much more time I have. Um, about 20 minutes. Oh, 20 minutes. OK, I'm OK. So anyway, so this is kind of interesting. Hmm? Uh, 10 minutes, that's a lot less. <laughs> 12 minutes. Depends okay. how many questions you want. Yeah, okay, depends on how many questions I get. So anyway, now there's another, but, but there's another problem which we can look at is three regular max cut, where here this is a max problem. This problem was a decision problem. And here we could, by quantum Monte Carlo, people could go out to about 160 bits. And here for this one, um, the gap is, uh, goes the best numerics say the gap goes like a exponential of minus 0.014n. But it also is kind of well fit by exponential of minus 0.24n to the 1 half. So again, you know, this is evidence that the gap is going exponentially. But it's, it's uh, only out to 160 bits. This is the best fit. But this is not a bad fit. So you have to draw your own conclusions. And this involved a very large scale uh, computer simulation. OK? So that's the status of the biggest numerical simulations for this kind of problem. There have been other simulations associated with the D wave machine, but I'm talking about this. So now, Eddie, yeah. So have, have you tried the uh, simulation to the stochastic 
Oh, I'm going to discuss stochasticity right now. That's my next topic. Okay? So, so there's, there's no general connection between the minimal gap and some other property of Hamiltonian which might be easier to calculate. If we knew that, I would be talking about it. Right. That's the huge question. Can we figure out what characteristic of the instance determines the gap? And that has been intractable. But I would like to say right now that this quantum Monte Carlo thing relies on a stochastic property of the Hamiltonian. And the stochastic is a term, I think Barbara Terrell, somebody coined it, which um, it, it's the property that all the off-diagonal elements of the Hamiltonian are less than or equal to zero for all z not equal to z prime. And in quantum Monte Carlo is a sampling technique. And in this sampling technique, um, the pr you, 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 you sample by doing um, numerical sampling in order to estimate the gap. I don't want to explain how it works, but what I want to say is that the probability in the algorithm from going from z to z prime is related to this matrix element. And it just doesn't work if this matrix element varies in sign. And so no one really knows how to do large-scale numerical simulations on Hamiltonians which are not stochastic. And, um, an, and uh, one feature of stochastic Hamiltonians, this, uh, this is a consequence of the perron frobenius theorem, is that if you look at the ground state of the stochastic Hamiltonian in the Z basis, that that's the basis in which this is true, that you find that all the uh, components of the ground state vector are larger than or equal to zero for all z. So that means that the coefficients of this uh, vector can be viewed as probabilities. And that is used in this sampling technique. So it's a little weird because usually, you know, quantum mechanically, you view amplitude squared as probabilities. But here, you can actually view the um, components themselves as probabilities, and that's what aids in the sampling. But this has implica computational implications, uh, complexity theory implications. It's a very special type of Hamiltonian? It's a very special type of Hamiltonian, yeah. So it doesn't apply to the, the Swiss set? No, no, no. It applies in the way that I set it up. It applied because the th it was only a question of the off-diagonal term. And the way I set it up, the off-diagonal terms all had were either zero or negative. So yes, the, the, the three sat, two sat, whatever, that just went on the diagonal. But the, the driving terms, the off-diagonal terms, that was stochastic the way I set it up. OK? That's what I want to talk about. But this has complexity theory implications. Because if you look at general Hamiltonians, then quantum k sat, which is, I mean, I don't have time to explain all this because I'm going too slow. But anyway, uh, let me just say the words. If you have a general Hamiltonian, I can, OK. If I start with a general Hamiltonian, then quantum k sat is QMA complete. The quantum k sat is a problem where, um, but uh, stochastic Hamiltonians, the same problems is in MA. This was shown by Bravi, Besson, and Terrell. So what this means is that um, there is a problem that you can formulate in terms of Hamiltonians. And you can ask uh, whether the, uh, wh whether if you want to convince somebody that you have the correct answer, whether you, when you present a witness. For this problem, quantum k sat, the witness is a quantum mechanical witness, and it needs to be verified by, a quantum, by someone who possesses a quantum computer. But if you restrict it to stochastic Hamiltonians, the problem is in MA, and what that just means is that there is a classical witness for this problem. I don't want to say exactly what MA is. It means Merlin author. There's another version of this, which is if you look at the local Hamiltonian problem, this is QMA complete, but if you restrict to stochastic Hamiltonians, it was shown by Bravi, DiVincenzo, Oliveira, and Terral, that this local Hamil problem, Hamiltonian problem is in AM, which is a slightly different version of this. But the, 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 the the uh, take-home message here is that from a complexity point of view, <coughs> the when, you take, when you ask questions about 
Hamiltonians. And when you think that answering those questions might show you the power of the um, of, of, of your quantum computer, it turns out that when you make the restriction to stochastic, then these problems become classical problems in the sense that the witness is classical. So there's something limiting about stochastic Hamiltonians. I'm trying, that's what my point is. There's something limiting about it. And, um, but unfortunately, that's, uh, that's what, and, and I think it's a very fascinating connection between the fact that from a complexity theory uh, from a complexity theory point of view, stochastic Hamiltonians are limited, and the only techniques we have for simulating large-scale Hamiltonians require them to be stochastic. I think these are related. And it's interesting, or, well, I don't know if it's interesting, but when we first put forth the adiabatic algorithm, we proposed something which was stochastic for no good reason. We didn't know what we were doing. But, so i just repeating what I said. We're only able to estimate gaps for Hamiltonians that are less powerful than general Hamiltonians. The original proposal was a stochastic. But this suggests that we, we change the nature of the Hamiltonian and that we move away from stochastic. And so what I want to imagine is I have some simple beginning Hamiltonian whose ground state I know. And instead of taking this path in Hamiltonian space to the problem Hamiltonian, I veer off of it and I go somewhere else in Hamiltonian space. Why not? And if you, so that, that's a suggestion for another way to run the algorithm. And here I don't mean, I'm not just talking about changing the time. I'm talking about taking a detour in Hamiltonian <laughs> space away from, from and, and so now, you, and then, it, you know, there was nothing special about the interpolating path that I first showed you, which kept you stochastic with that linear interpolation. The adiabatic theorem still applies if I take this path or this path or any other path within Hamiltonian space. As long as I go slowly enough, I'll stay in the ground state, so why not? And so, you know, there's another version of the adiabatic theorem where you say for each instance, run the quantum adiabatic with many randomly selected paths from the beginning to the problem Hamiltonian. And that actually works. There's an example here. Um, if you look at a, a, a particular problem where the cost function depends only on the Hamming weight, but the cost function depends only on the Hamming weight, but it, it's arranged so that the cost function has this kind of shape. So what happens here is that um, the true minimum is over here, and there's a false minimum over here. But if you were to do something like simulated annealing, oh no, I think I should have put the bump a little to the right. Ah, I didn't draw it well enough. I should have put the bump a little to the right. Sorry, I made a little mistake. I should have put this over a little bit. I, when I hand draw these things, this should be a little further to the right. Okay, so the reason I want that is because if you run something like simulated annealing, then what happens is when you start with a random string, its Hamming weight is n over two, and then you go that way. And it's true that if you run the quantum adiabatic algorithm the way I originally proposed it uh, on, the, on those previous slides with that stochastic linear interpolation, that this, um, the quantum adiabatic algorithm will fail. It will take exponential time to find the solution. But if you suggest, a, but if you run it with random paths chosen in some reasonable fashion according to some distribution, then this turns failure into success. So this is a case where path change can actually turn something which looks like failure to success. And there's, an, um, there's another example of that, which, um, which has to do with small gaps at the end of the evolution. And this may be very relevant to some of you who may be paying attention to what's going on within the discussion of the D-wave thing, where they talk about small gaps at the end of the evolution. Because um, th when you have, what happens th is the following thing. You, this is near the end of the evolution where S is 1. Here is state A, which is the true ground state. That's where you want to go. And here is B, which is an excited state. And these two states are very different. These are classical <coughs> strings. They're very different in Hamming weight. And what happens here is that you're tracking along uh, the ground what happens here. You're tracking along the, ground, the, the lowest energy state here and you come to this point. Now, there, I drew this like these things are actually crossing. 
But there really is a tiny gap there. You know, if you blew this up a lot, you'd see that those levels are not crossing. Levels never cross. I could tell you why that is, but in quantum systems, levels never cross. They come incredibly close, but they never cross. What? Why didn't I do that with my pen? No, no, I'm just, I'm just Yeah, I could have done it better. Yeah, I could have, I was, I was going to make a blow-up cartoon of it, but I'm just saying it, right. Because, um, right. So, so, they, they, so what happens here is that even though the gap is not zero, if you're going too fast, which is not incredibly slow, then what will happen is you will, you will go to here to B, and you miss the true uh, minimum. And this is a situation which people have been saying can arise quite naturally in many circumstances. And Boris Alshula wrote a series of papers saying that this is going to doom the adiabatic algorithm. And um, what is interesting here, though, is that uh, if you run path change, in other words, if you, random, if you randomize the Hamiltonian, you can sometimes make the slope of this line larger than the slope of this line, so they actually go apart, and the gap opens up. And this was shown by me and some of my collaborators, including Peter Shore, that this can actually work to open up gaps in um, certain systems. Now, if you have, it'll certainly open up, if you have one bad guy, it'll certainly fix it. If you have a few bad guys, it'll certainly fix it. But if you had an exponential number of bad guys, it won't fix it. So I think that this, again, suggests that path change is something that we really need to do. And, but I, you know, path change, it's, it's something that makes it very hard to show that you have a real counterexample to the adiabatic algorithm. Because if you tell me that your gap is small along a particular path, I think it's going to be very challenging to show me that it's small along a whole series of paths. So, good idea. Mm -hmm. you, you choose random paths. And then in some of them there is a gap, and in some of them there right. is not, and then some of them will give you good results. Yeah, but in these kind of pro well, no, in these kind of problems, uh, even you know, if this is a, if this is a problem where you're trying to see if there's a satisfying assignment, if if, if you just take the best one, and if it satisfies, you're done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can take the best one; is good enough. So um, I think this is sort of interesting. And OK, so now I want to talk about something a little bit different, because sometimes people talk about the quantum adiabatic algorithm uh, tunneling. So I want to give an example of how that might come about. Ah, OK. So here I consider an example where the cost function is the Hamming weight. And if, forget this spike for a second. If the cost function is the Hamming weight, then you're just going to roll down the hill by almost any algorithm to this point, which has zero Hamming weight, and that's the satisfying assignment. The satisfying assignment here is zero Hamming weight. But now we put at a one particular place a spike so that the cost function jumps up to a higher value. Now what happens then is if you run something like simulated annealing, what happens is simulated annealing won't jump across this thing because the cost is too high. So you, you built a barrier. It's like a classical barrier to, in the problem. Now, uh, the quantum adiabatic will jump across this. It'll tunnel through it. Now, s people have said, well, it's too skinny. It's only one thick. So you better make it fatter. And if you, we can actually make it fatter, and you'll still tunnel through. So it's not, you can't make it too fat, because that'll stop you from tunneling. So if you have a slightly fat but not too fat spike, you can tunnel through. And this shows the difference between simulated annealing and the quantum adiabatic algorithm. They really are not the same. Just like quantum Monte Carlo and the adiabatic are not the same. Ah, I should have talked about that too. There was a recent paper by Hastings showing that. So anyway, um, I think this is one of the reasons also people are interested in the adiabatic, because they always talk about it tunneling. I don't know how generic that is. I know that you can make very special cases when that happens. I would be loath to say that that's a generic feature of it, that it tunnels to the right place. I don't know. Um, but now I want to talk about one more topic, and then I'll stop. I want to talk about quantum search by measurement. Um, so I, I would like to now talk about something which we thought about a long time ago. But it's an alternative to the adiabatic algorithm, but it's very related. And um, that is the following thing. I, I want to always stay in the ground state of a system. And instead of adiabatically evolving, 
what I'm going to do is something else. I'm, I imagine I have a parameterized Hamiltonian H of S. And suppose at time uh, or parameter value S, your state is the ground state of the quantum system. Now what I want to do is I want to measure the Hamiltonian at S plus delta. Now when you measure the Hamiltonian at S plus delta, you're going to get an eigenstate of this Hamiltonian at S plus delta. But if delta is very small, then the ground state here will have a big overlap with the ground state at S plus delta, and you get that state. So if delta is very, very little, and you can, um, you, so in this, out, what you hear we're going to do is we're going to track the ground state of H of S by making measurements. You start in the ground state, you vary the Hamiltonian just a little bit, you, bet, you measure, you, tr you go, you measure, you keep doing it. And we can show that, um, it, you know, I, I just wrote that down as a simple example. It, let H of S be 1 minus of S the beginning plus a problem. Start in the ground state of the beginning Hamiltonian. Want the ground state of the problem Hamiltonian. But we're going to do it by successive measurements. Well, you can then ask, how many measurements do you have to make? Well, if you analyze, it turns out the number of measurements you have to make goes like 1 over the gap squared in order to end up, in the end, with a high probability of being in the... Um, ground state. Now, there's an, um, something a lot trickier here, because you can ask, how long does each measurement take? And eat the measurement time for each measurement goes like one over the gap by just the time energy uncertainty principle. So actually, the runtime of this algorithm goes like one over the gap cubed, because the measurements take time. I only have one more slide, I think. OK. And the one thing that's amusing about this thing is you can actually solve the Grover problem with two measurements. So you, um, you know where the gap is smallest. Let's call that S star. And if you start in the ground state of zero and then you measure at the place where the gap is smallest, you make one measurement there, and then you measure again at the end. You make two measurements. You will solve the Grover problem with 50% probability. However, the measurement time takes n to the one half, so you don't beat the Grover bound. You don't beat the Umesh at all bound on this problem. But anyway, what I want to say about this is that quantum search by measurement looks like the quantum adiabatic algorithm, but it does a, not apparently require unitary time evolution, which I think is sort of interesting. That, you know, it may be that without actually having unitary time evolution, but even just as long as I can somehow or another always project into the ground state, I can get to the same place I would have had I followed the unitary time evolution. And I think that's an alternative view of this which might be helpful in understanding other things. Okay? I think I am done. Thank you. Sorry, I went over. Uh, sorry, is a quantum uh, search by is it is related to uh, dynamic uh, quantum zero? Can you use the mic? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I, okay. I, uh, he, the, the question uh, about the quantum search by measurements is it related to dynamic quantum zero effect? When I you think observe, uh, the uh, time dependent observable, the system follows uh, evolution if you measure too frequently. I think it's the same thing. The same. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like exactly the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I heard that the D-Wave machine uh, has some, uh, uh, something impressive to show recently. Is it related to, I mean, does anyone understand uh, its relation uh, with the adiabatic? I don't know. Computer? You mean, I don't know. Honestly, I don't. I don't know whether the D-Wave machine, I don't know whether the D-Wave machine might be doing that. I don't know. So, uh, back. Go ahead. Hmm. Okay. So back, to the, uh, back to the case at uh, problem on a ring. Yeah. Uh, how uh, how do you find that? Um, how do you write that Hamilton? And you mentioned something about the Jordan Wigner transform, right? Yeah. Here's the. This is the Hamiltonian okay. in terms of spins, and then what we do uh, is we make a Wigner-Jordan transformation. 
And but the Big Jordan transformation reduces it from a two to the n dimensional discussion to a two times n dimensional problem. Okay, but uh, my question was, but uh, on the ring, yeah. uh, doesn't, doesn't it appear a non-local term? I mean, there must be a linking gap, right? So you have to choose an ordering from, I don't know, one to n. Yeah. And then when you consider um, the interactions between position one and n, so how do you deal with that? Uh? I don't remember. Ah. You know, I don't know. But it, okay. I promise you, Thanks. it's in my paper in the year 2000. Ah. Everything is spelled out. I don't remember how we handled the boundary. You know, but I promise you it's there. We did it. It's right there. You can please read my paper. It's there. I don't remember how we did that. Okay, last question. Um, sure. Okay, so um, has anyone ever considered um, a robust version of the adiabatic theorem in the sense that uh, well, from the talk, I, I see that um, whenever you cross the first energy level, you think, I mean, you say you're dead, right? But normally, when you have the PCP theorem, I can yeah. allow you to violate maybe one third of the constraint. So, right. so unless something happens after you cross the first energy level and you're yeah, yeah. Uh, deteriorating very rapidly, uh, it could be still useful with, with an exponentially small gap, right? Yes, I agree with that. I mean, I, you know, I think that's a whole other question, which unfortunately, I don't have the theoretical tools to address. But I think you could certainly ask the question of, you know, is the adiabatic algorithm useful for approximation? You know, could you approximate the solution to a problem? Could you approximate the solution to a problem? You know, I'm interested in questions like, can you approximate the solution to a problem where achieving the approximation would not show that p equals np, but would just show unique games as false? You know, that's what interests me. That's what I would like to find as an algorithm for that kind of thing. So yeah, I think that's really interesting. But I don't really have much to say about it other than I think it's really interesting. And I think that's something I think about. You know, the Approximation algorithms, not at the p versus np boundary, but, er, but back. Does that answer your question? So maybe for an, an extra methodist a question. So yeah. you're dealing with an interacting many body system. Yeah. And you're requesting it to be at t equals 0. Temperature t equals zero. In this discussion, I did, yeah. Which uh, you basically never have. Yeah. So how much, does that kill it completely, or does it not? Well, that's a great question. I mean, let, let's say the following. Ob well, you know, obviously, if you could make the temperature smaller than the gap, you would be pretty happy. So that would be good. But um, you know, if the temperature is bigger than the gap, can you still have some kind of, you know, quantumness remain? I don't have an honest answer to that. I don't know. There is a related comment. It's not what? just the temperature, it's also the thermalization rate. Yeah. They, they, they go together. OK, I can't resist allowing one more question. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, coming back to Andy's question about DV, so most of it, you know, so some of us in computation would, would think that you know, even though it, it's probably not very interesting from a computational viewpoint, uh, what D-Wave is doing might be very fundamental physics. What do you think of that? Fundamental physics? I, 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 uh, I, I think it's extremely interesting to know if D-Wave has a quantum device independent of the issue of whether or not they're achieving algorithmic speed up. Right, I think so that's a fascinating question. I mean, you know, I. I think there's separate issues. Is there algorithmic speed up? And is, do, or do they have quantumness? Because if they can't achieve quantumness, I, I'm not too optimistic about them achieving no. algorithmic speed yeah, up. But, but my question was, you know, let, let's say we believe that you know, this is really it, the quantum adiabatic algorithm takes exponential time on realistic instances. We could say and, so, and so it's really not a path towards computation, an interesting computational result. But it's still, maybe what D-Wave is doing is implementing a new way of uh, doing, uh, you know, performing experiments in physics. And maybe they're doing fundamental physics. You know, so maybe what they've done is create a different way of, of, of setting up experiments where, you know, you, you know, in the form of, you know, where they have, uh, where it's not, you know, it's not that they are computing faster but they have a better user interface, like a computer, for doing your experiments. And now, they're, you know, if they're actually getting any kind of uh, entanglement, then this would be a way of doing fun, you know, so 
maybe the physicists should be more interested than computer scientists in what they're doing? Well, you know, well, first of all, you know, I come from particle physics. Uh, that was my upbringing. And I work on general relativity and all this stuff. So what fundamental means to me is probably very different to what fundamental means to you, a computer scientist. That's right. Um, I, I, right, you know, so I have a sense, you know, to me, fundamental has to do with undis discovering the fundamental laws of nature at a very tiny scale. And I am interested in knowing, you know, that's why I care about what's happening at the LHC. And I want to know about parity <laughs> violation. And I want to know where the masses of quarks and leptons see, come so from. Maybe, maybe what you're saying is... No, so the, the, perhaps what you're saying is it, it might fall be between the cracks because what, what computation means to me is very different from what it means to you and what physics means to you is very different. Yeah, from it's what possible, it right. You see, so I have a different <laughs> sense. I mean, no, I, you see, I, 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 I am skeptical that uh, I am personally slightly skeptical that, uh, you know, uh, ex quantum experiments even if you go to 500 or 1,000 qubits, are ever going to reveal anything which was not anticipated by quantum law. I don't see a possibility. I don't, I don't anticipate a, any kind of change in the nature of quantum law. I believe in quantum mechanics. There's never been a violation of quantum mechanics ever seen. Quantum mechanics explains all of chemistry. It explains why glass is transparent. Quantum mechanics works is consistent with the special theory of relativity. When they create the Higgs boson at the LHC, it obeys quantum law. So I, I am I'm a believer in quantum law, and I don't think that suddenly when you go to 500 qubits, quantum law is going to fa fall apart. I don't. You know, I think the quantum law that I've learned to love, which explains all of chemistry, is going to continue to be true. So I think the chances of learning anything about quantum mechanics is slim. But I think that the chances of learning something about how to build devices, how to control systems, how to make, you know, great technical achievement is high. And therefore, I think the D-Wave machine, if they can actually prove they have a quantum device, would be amazingly would be important from that point of view. But I'm not going to quite go and say it's fundamental. OK, I'm going to cut the, this exciting discussion and, and forward it to lunch. And whoever okay. wants to shout without the mic is welcome yeah. while we're clapping. OK. Uh, thank you. And, and we're going for, uh, uh, for a not less exciting topic, which is, very, which is tightly related, um, quantum random walks. And, uh, we're going to hear about it from uh, Yaron Silverberg.